Thank you for tuning in to the Bread of the Word podcast. Bread of the Word is an online ministry striving to feed people the life-sustaining bread of God's Word. Bread of the Word exists for the reclamation of the Bible in the heart, mind, and walk of all the saints of God, for it is the Bible itself which is the ultimate standard by which people are to live and honor God. Thank you for tuning in. This is Bread of the Word. Welcome back to the Bread of the Word podcast, Reclaiming the Bible and Exalting Christ, one verse at a time. My name is Tyler, and we are continuing in our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. We've been going verse by verse for a couple weeks now, and we are wrapping up chapter 1 on the subject of wisdom. And as we've been working through this book, we've been asking the core existential questions that make us whole. And we now come here to the subject of wisdom. What is wisdom? What is its use? How can it be misused? And these are questions that we find Solomon was asking many, many centuries ago. And he writes in verses 12 through 18, I, the teacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task. To keep them occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found them to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. And I said to myself, see, I have amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge madness and folly. I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind, for with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. <clears throat> On this book <clears throat> that is before us of Ecclesiastes, this is where a lot of our, um, this is where it gets hard to read sometimes, because this is depressing. As knowledge increases, so does grief. These are not things that we enjoy reading. And these are not um, exactly the subject of these lofty academic theological treatises either. Alistair Begg sums up the book of Ecclesiastes in this way. And he says, The tone of Ecclesiastes is not that of a prophet declaring the word of the Lord, but rather that of a philosopher commenting on the world. He's not standing up in this book to make these big pronouncements, but he's essentially saying to the readership, why don't we walk down a few of these roads together? Why don't we think this out together? And he appeals to universally observable facts and invites the reader to ask, does life have any point? And if so, what is the point? That's essentially the heart of it all. And that sentiment is demonstrated in these first couple verses here. I, the teacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. And God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. In Jewish culture, the heart symbolized the center of physical being. We have a tendency to apply that to the mind. I'm characterized in statements like, you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. That, that is very much, in terms of metaphysics and ontology, that we think that what makes us us resides in the mind, in the head. While as the Jews apply that to the heart or the belly, because those were closer to the center of your body. And they thought that your, um, the center of your essence was in the center of your body. And this is imagery that God uses as he reveals himself through Jewish poetry. One good example is Jonah chapter 2, when he uses both elements. 
<clears throat> and you're right. Um, so Jonah chapter 2, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol, and you heard my voice. When you threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and billows swept over me. But he closes that prayer with, But as for me, I will sacrifice you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed, for salvation belongs to the Lord. So Jonah was down in the depths. So he was essentially in the center of all that is separate from God. That he was in the heart of the depths of the sea. He was in the belly of this fish that cut him off from the presence of God. But yet he was able to say, salvation belongs to the Lord. Charles Spurgeon comments on this verse saying that Jonah learned the sentence of good theology in a strange college. He learned it in the whale's belly at the bottom of the mountains with the seaweed wrapped around his head. He supposed that the earth with her bars was about him forever. Most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with the hot iron of affliction. Otherwise, we shall not truly receive them. Jonah felt as though he was in the heart or center of all that was separated from God. And that's a poetic device that Jesus uses elsewhere in Matthew chapter 12. For as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days... And three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Likewise, Solomon applied the very center of his physical being, all that he was, to examining the world in which he resided. He set out to examine both himself and the world around him with a critical eye, something we often shy away from. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that theology is simply the part of religion that requires brains. There, there is, in fact, room for careful thought in Christianity. Faith and reason work together. And so how does Solomon describe this pursuit? He says that God has given this miserable task to people to give them occupied. The Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, renders it a little different, calling it a wicked distraction. Earlier verses describe humans as being busy, yet unsatisfied. Our pursuit of wisdom, says Solomon, is an attempt to shepherd the wind. But as he says in verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. Often we view wisdom as Eve viewed the forbidden fruit. Genesis 3, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. John, in his letters, divides sin into three types. In chapter 2, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. Wisdom that fails to honor its source is likewise. It is the lust of the earth. Proverbs 1.7, which was also written by Solomon, says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So, so we come back here to what is crooked cannot be straightened. Which is a strange image for us to imagine. Because if I had a golf club that was crooked, there are tools that I could utilize to straighten that out. But the reality is... I may be able to knock out a lot of the notches. I may be able to make it straighter. But I cannot give that golf club, as skilled as I may be with my hands, I cannot give that golf club the purity of, of it being straight. I cannot make it without blemish. 
I cannot change it on that level with that much detail. So we cannot straighten what God has made crooked or vice versa. And much like Captain Ahab, who thought he had mastered the white whale, we often view wisdom as a means to circumscribe God himself. But by doing so, we misuse wisdom. I would dare to say that we even misunderstand what wisdom is. Because if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, if this is where wisdom begins, then for us to pursue wisdom apart from God is unimaginable folly. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 it says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of his age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So here we see the limitations of wisdom that is purely head knowledge. It is folly calling itself wisdom. True wisdom is rooted in the reality that there is a God above us who is not bound to us, but we are bound to him. We cannot make straight what has what God has made crooked or vice versa. God's wisdom makes our, quote, wisdom look like the foolishness that it is. Job 41 paints a pretty potent picture of this. Job is Job is another book we don't necessarily like to read. Job is is a man from a long time ago and he lost everything material in his life. He lost his wealth, he lost his house, he lost his entire family. And at towards the end of the book, Job is dialoguing with God and he is not exactly grateful. And he is demanding answers from God. And God responds several times, but one of his responses in Job 41 is very unique. And he says, Can you pull in Leviathan with a hook, or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he beg you for mercy, or speak softly to you? God has illustrated to Job in the preceding chapters different animals that are examples of God's masterful creation, of his sovereignty and his providence, and the fact that he is the God who made these animals and surely knows what he's doing with Job. And with Leviathan, this is another example. I believe that Leviathan is likely a dinosaur. There is um, ample arc... Um, archaeological evidence that the dinosaurs were around during the time of people. There are cave paintings of um, people riding dinosaurs. There are reports from Alexander the Great during his conquest of Asia that detail animals res resembling what we would later call dinosaurs, like sauropods, that he encountered these ginormous l lizards. And so I don't think it a stretch that if God made the dinosaur, that God speaks of the dinosaur as his creation. And so Leviathan is a testament to Job of the greatness of God the creator. This massive animal, this massive creature that cannot be tamed with a hook or a rope. He is not to be trifled with in that way. Nebuchadnezzar writes in Daniel chapter 4, all his works are true, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. See, true foolishness can be defined as trying to be wise while disregarding the source of truth. 
And many of us look at God, and we try to wrangle Leviathan with a hook or with a rope, and we try to bring him down to our level. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And it is, it is exhausting to wrestle with Leviathan, to try and make him fit my mold of what I think he should be. God, this is the God to whom we are estranged, is one who cannot be tamed. This righteous God that cannot be brought low by man. But we are created by him. And he's to be taken seriously. So back to Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, I have amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge, madness and folly. And I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind. As knowledge increases, grief increases. In short, as we pursue knowledge, and not as we pursue to know more, there's also this recognition that we are not God. That God is greater than us. That as we pursue knowledge, there is grief as we lament the fact that we are broken people. That we are sinful people. That society is not good. That we are not good. And we, in our pride, go astray, thinking we are wise, but we've become fools. Isaiah 47 says, You felt secure in your wickedness. And you said, No one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. Often we get puffed up in pride and this idea that we are self-sufficient, that we have autonomy, we are independent. And our desire to be wise in our own eyes to that end has caused us to forsake God, thus bringing judgment on ourselves because we are not the final authority on this earth. Romans 1 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images rese resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up, in the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. That is the state of our hearts. And that is how we come into this world. We come into this world broken by sin inclined to all that is wicked and, and wrong. And there is a remedy for that in Christ, who is the only wise, eternal king. To repair that which was broken, God sent himself. The person of Christ, f perfectly united with the Father and Spirit in the same substance, comes down into our world, our history, our landscape, our mess. And he takes on a human form. He is born as a human. 
He experiences birth, life, and death, as all humans do. But he didn't do what we do. He didn't sin. He never knew sin, it's, the Bible says. But he lived the perfect, perfect life that you and I could never live. That he was truly wise. And he used it as one who is wise. That he was the embodiment of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that beareth fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And what he set out to do, he accomplished. And he lived that perfect life. And he died an undeserved sinner's death as a criminal. And absorbed the punishment that should have been on us. Us depraved people. Us wicked people. He satisfied that just punishment. And God exacted justice on himself. In order that the righteous requirement of God could be fulfilled in us. Who come to Christ with faith and repentance. And are indwelled with his spirit. And we have a new mind. We have a new operating system. That inclines us to that which is good. So that we don't have to be what Romans 1 tells us we are. But we can be what Romans 8 tells us we are. That there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For the law the spirit of life. Has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh, in human form, in order that that righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this is done by the same God who created us and the same God to whom we have been estranged. And my, I, I implore you today, let us return to our Creator, who is infinitely wise and just, who is not to be trifled with, and the one to whom we are dependent for grace and restoration, as accomplished through Christ on the cross. Conrad M. Bayway once put it that the sacrifice of God's Son on the cross is the fireplace where we warm our cold hearts toward God. And in closing, consider this psalm, Psalm 95. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hill is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And in his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bread of the Word podcast. I pray that it has been beneficial to your walk with God and that he has called you into a deeper relationship and fellowship with himself. If you want to hear more from Bread of the Word, feel free to hit that subscribe button down at the bottom. Get notified about new content whenever we go live. Um, you can also watch us on Rumble Video and YouTube, or you can listen on your favorite podcast platforms. Um, you can also find us on social media. If you want to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Gab. Links will be provided in the bio um, if you would like to check those out. And there will also be a message in the comment section, um, a free gospel message for download entitled The Two J's, The Joy of the Potter and the Journey of the Clay. That is something that I've written. That is something God laid on me to write and then send out. 
And so I'm not making anything off of it. I'm not selling it. It is free for you to read and share. We need a further saturation of the gospel in our world, in our culture. And it starts right here. Bread of the Word Ministries exists for the reclamation of the Bible and the exaltation of Christ through the reading and teaching of His holy transformative Word. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. God bless. Matthew 4.4 4.